Chapter 8. Minimalist Sailboating 99.9% .9 of land here on planet Earth has been laid claim to by some government, which would suggest that there aren't many places self-liberators can go to be free. When it comes to stationary dwellings on land, that's certainly true, especially considering the fee-simple system of land ownership here in at least America, if not every other nation or country as well. There really is no such thing as private property when it comes to land ownership. The state truly is your landlord. If you don't believe me, try not paying your yearly rent, otherwise known as property taxes. You'd be lucky to only have the landlord come and knock it. Not to mention other issues that may arise with owning land, such as nuisance abatement, which is extremely relevant if one is going to be off-grid homesteading, the difficulty of picking up and moving if necessary, and obviously, the expensive cost of stationary dwellings, among other things. That said, 71% of this planet is made up of wide open ocean. This translates to over 332,519,000 cubic miles of water, as estimated by the U.S. Geological Survey. And yet, in large part, humans have yet to even begin utilizing the seemingly endless possibilities abound. As Rayo said, if your state of anchorage becomes intolerable, don't waste energy in extended public criticism or conflict. Apply your free market principles by setting sail for sunnier waters. Rayo, Innovator, March 1967. Let's begin by discussing the arbitrary boundaries selected and enforced by current nation states. Contiguous zones. A band of water extending from the outer edge of the territorial sea up to 24 nautical miles, 27.6 land miles, from the baseline, within which a state can exert limited control for the purpose of preventing or punishing infringement of its customs, fiscal, immigration, or sanitary laws and regulations. Exclusive economic zone extends from the outer limit of the territorial sea to a maximum of 200 nautical miles, 230.2 miles, from the territorial sea baseline. A coastal nation has control of all economic resources within its exhaustive economic zone. However, it cannot prohibit passage or loitering above, on, or under the surface of the sea. Reason would dictate, then, that as long as Avanuin is at least 24.1 nautical miles off the coast of an existing nation or country, they are, for the most part, outside of any government's jurisdiction. That is, unless they are mining minerals off the ocean floor, attempting to deliver or manufacture nuclear weapons, or if they are part of an international drug smuggling ring. As the description said above, a government cannot stop you from crossing their EEZ. Obviously, as Vanuans, we know not to rely upon these legal intercises, but it's necessary information to possess regardless. All of that said, when would sailing Vanuans have to deal with the coercion of the bludgies? When an individual is beginning their journey, namely when they are obtaining their flag of convenience, in short, international law requires a ship to be registered in a country, or else you'll be regarded as a pirate. When an individual is entering the port of a country, I don't know what this process consists of, but there will be dealings with bludgies. They might search your boat. Outside of those two scenarios, there shouldn't be any other interactions with government, especially if you're spending most of your time on the high seas. Case study. City Jim to Captain Jim. Jim Smith spent his entire childhood and most of his 30s in the communist hellhole known as New York City. He graduated with an engineering degree from Columbia University, only to end up as a contractor for Boeing, putting together the next design for the military's F-35 fighter jets. And he truly did love his work. I made it, he thought to himself. I'm 24 years old, and I'm pulling in six figures. Fast forward a few years, and he is happily married to his wife, Katie. They actually met each other at a mosh pit in a killer Veil of Maya show. In a normal context, the way they met probably would have been considered spousal abuse. But in this circumstance, it was love at first accidental elbow to Katie's face. They're in a great financial situation for their age, statist servile society standards, that is. But they aren't positive if they want to rear offspring or not. They decide to put it off for a few years. Jim is still plugging away at Boeing. He received numerous commendations for his superior work, but they just aren't doing much for him anymore. The law of diminishing returns in action, maybe? Not so much. When he was younger, he didn't much care what the product of his labor was used for. He didn't even think about it. He was there to collect his weekly paycheck so he could go chase women at nightclubs, and that was it. Then the Bradley Manning leaks happened. He saw the realities of war firsthand and realized that his job was far more than just schematics and mathematics. He was producing weapons of mass murder. It was then that he knew he had to make a change. He requested an internal reassignment to private sector work, but it was denied. So, he quit unsure as to what his future may hold. When he went home, he vented his frustrations and outrage to an understanding Katie. Like most, 
She really didn't have any idea what was going on in the geopolitical realm, but she could see that this was eating Jim up inside, and rightfully so. She decided to retreat to her office to think. After some thorough research on the internet that evening, Katie came across a podcast episode titled The Anti-War Rayo, released by two folks, Shane and Jason. They laid down in their bed and listened together before they went to sleep. This was the start of their journey as Vanuans. Over the course of the next few weeks, they scoured all of the content currently available on this freedom strategy called Vanu and this really interesting guy named Rayo. They sold their house, got rid of 98% of their belongings, bought a brand new Mercedes-Benz Sprinter van, converted it into a liveaboard rig, and traveled across the U.S. for the next few years. They enjoyed the van nomad lifestyle, but realized it wasn't exactly where they would like to be. They recalled Rayo's quote about setting sail for sunnier waters and decided to invest in a 49-foot Juno Sun Odyssey sailboat. Since neither of them have any experience in this realm, they took some boating classes and paid an experienced skipper to take them out a few times. They took it slow, but they were adept in no time. After a couple of years on the water, they decided they wanted to have a child. They were only getting older, and the years were running out. Surprisingly enough, they had twins, Alice and Frank. After ensuring the babies were healthy and spending some time settling in as parents, they set sail as a family for the very first time. When Alice and Frank get a little older, Jim and Katie plan on unschooling them. Case study. From skipping school to skipper. Nathan Scott somehow graduated high school this year, and like most high school age kids, he has no idea what he wants to do with his life. He's in a more interesting situation, though, compared to his peers. When he was a freshman, he came across the Bad Quaker podcast, hosted by a guy named Ben Stone. Ben introduced Nathan to the concept of anarchism, a label he now proudly proclaims. His parents think he's just trying to be cool, but he has extremely good philosophical, ethical, economic, and practical reasons for his hatred of the state. And he's passionate about the idea of freedom. He's a regular listener to the Vanu podcast, and he knows higher-level indoctrination, college, is not for him. Hell, he knows a normal 9-to-5 servile society job would drive him mad. He's considered van nomadism as an interim lifestyle, but he agrees with Rayo. The strategy's reliance on slave tags is unsettling. So where does that leave young Nathan? He wants to set sail for sunnier waters. He has no idea what he's doing, he has no money to do it, but he's made his goal. And as a dedicated freedom pioneer, he won't take no for an answer. Thankfully, his young age means that he has no debt to take care of, no affairs to get in order, i.e. selling a house, and no one dependent upon him. He can safely take some risks, especially considering he's on his parents' health insurance for another eight years. Living on the West Coast, he knows that there are occasionally positions open at marinas or docks for maintenance, service, and janitorial duties. At least, he thinks to himself, this will be a start. I can learn the basics and go from there. So he applies for an open dock position, and he gets it. The seasons change as six months go by, and he notices a boat that has not moved a lick since he began to work. It's a 42-foot, 1992 Laguna TPI sailboat. Overall, it's in super rough condition and could use a lot of work. He goes to his boss and inquires further. It's been abandoned for six years. You can have it for a thousand bucks if you get it the hell out of my marina. The now Captain Scott took the deal and began to refurbish and restore this once exquisite sailboat. He gave it a deep cleaning, replaced the propeller, stripped most of the electrical as there was quite a bit of exposed wire, and modified the living quarters. While he restored the boat, his boss took him for a little sailing adventures on a similar boat so he could learn the ropes. He learned how to navigate the ocean, operate the levers and pulleys that raised and lowered the sails, the necessary sailing terminology, and even got a couple experiences in nasty storms. During the process of restoration, Nathan lived minimally and frugally, saving as much money as he possibly could. Thankfully, due to his young age, he had not accumulated too much stuff, and therefore there wasn't much to get rid of. All of his belongings fit snugly aboard. His goal was to have a year or two of income saved up so that he could focus his efforts on self-liberational media, i.e. a YouTube channel, writing a book, etc. After a couple of years of hard work, Libertas was ready to set sail, and so was he. He charted his journey southwards in the direction of Ecuador and truly began his life as a Vanuan. And it was a good life. He soon learned that boat maintenance is time-consuming and can be expensive, but he made it work. He chronicled his adventures in the form of self-liberational media. He was unable to afford the ridiculously expensive high-seas internet and opted instead to record a batch of podcasts each month and return to land to upload them. He utilized WordPress schedule post function, which allowed him to keep his audience tuned into a steady stream of content. For paying subscribers, he even gave them the opportunity to sail with him. It's a great opportunity for him to fund his adventures and a reward well worth paying for his listeners. As he became more competent, he realized that he wanted to return to the statist servile society less and less for import-export. 
He theorized about the possibility of somehow making himself more self-sufficient aboard Libertas. He thought of hauling some sort of a floating platform behind him which he would load with fresh, organic vegetables. After further consideration, he realized that was probably a no-go. He recalled Rayo's discussion on something called cryptoculture, or small, hidden patches of food which could be harvested. What if I grow my own food on an uninhabited ocean island? So he sailed around and found the ideal candidate. Now he was able to provide 100% of his food himself. Fresh vegetables on the island and fresh seafood from the ocean. As is the case with any Vanuan, he became more and more competent as the years went on. And from his self-liberational media, he was recruiting people in droves to make radical lifestyle changes in pursuance of freedom. He learned firsthand the accuracy of an oft-said proverb, A rising tide raises all boats. Making money on the open ocean. It's worth a few notes on ways to make money while sailing full-time. Back in 1966, Carrie Thornley published a series of articles sharing the same title as the next section. That will be the source of most of this information. For smaller boats, there aren't a whole lot of options. The few that come to mind are self-liberational media, digital nomadism, and consulting. For larger boats, the options expand quite drastically. Thornley elucidates, Charter sailing tourists in colorful parts of the world is a good way to make money while living at sea. But it's not the only way in which a large boat can serve as a tool of production. Simple freedom from police harassment for group activities, such as wild parties, clandestine political meetings, illegal medical operations, is a valuable condition which a boat captain can provide for a fee. In addition, he can run cargoes to out-of-the-way places, unserviced by major shippers, provide transportation to escaping political refugees, and undertake speculative anti-state ventures, such as smuggling of American cigarettes into Spain, where high tariffs make such operations, however dangerous, extremely profitable. Smuggling opportunities in a world of anti-libertarian trade policies, in fact, are legion. One can take diamonds out of Africa and South America, run arms to rebels in Cuba, land used auto and refrigerator parts in Mexico, bring gold into certain near-totalitarian countries where ownership of some is unlawful, all for life, liberty, and property. Obviously, I would never advocate you do anything illegal. If you decide to pursue any of the above methods, you do so at your own risk and of your own accord. There are even larger applications to this strategy, which could bring in a substantial amount of money, but carry a lot more risk. Let's run through a hypothetical example here. Assuming that there is somehow a massively funded anarchist organization, the Maritime Mesians, or TMM. TMM, an anarchist organization of roughly 20 members made rich from digital currencies, see an opportunity for huge profit in the open ocean. A floating, mobile, sovereign, free port of sorts, governments have this tendency to regulate everything into oblivion, which halts innovation, increases the barriers to entry, and makes a previously affordable product or service extraordinarily expensive. There is no industry more applicable here than Big Pharma. Imagine the possibilities of an unhampered, unregulated medical industry in the open ocean. Think revolutionary medical research. No taxes or regulations and an actually affordable product. So, TMM decided to buy a large decommissioned aircraft carrier from the Navy. Where else would you get one of those? For $2.8 million. Actual price of one for sale in 2016. And outfitted as a giant marketplace. To keep themselves out of the line of fire of nation states, they take the following precautions. Nuclear weapons are banned from sale. The location of aircraft carrier changes often, although always in international waters, 200 plus miles off of any established coast. The entrepreneurs place a limit on the amount of drugs able to be purchased and transported elsewhere. All the state has to do is claim that the confiscated drugs came from there and they'd be at risk to face the wrath of the state. In addition to just being a marketplace, there are also medical research labs, medical operation rooms, a nightclub, and a luxurious restaurant. The two big difficulties TMM faces is, one, nation-state interference, and two, finding customers to patronize the aircraft carrier. I present this example more so as a thought exercise rather than a serious suggestion. Obviously, this isn't in line with minimalist sailboating. We likely won't see any of this come to fruition anytime soon. If you refer back to the mean time to harassment, something like this would certainly be H-level Vanu. As far as I know, there's no way to hide an aircraft carrier. Higher risk, higher reward. The Permanent Floating Voluntary Society When I tell the story of Rayo, one of the first retorts I often receive is, I don't want to live in isolation. For the most part, I don't either. But it would be wise to begin your journey as a solo Vanuan unless you already have a freemate, significant other, children, etc. Rayo provides some wise advice on the subject. Many a man will say and sincerely believe that he wants to Vanu just as soon as he finds the right woman or the right group. 
to do it with, but he doesn't want to do it alone. However, how do you and he know that he can do it until he does it for a substantial time? If he can't stand living alone, if he soon gets bored with himself, chances are he will soon get bored with you too. So suggest that he do it alone for a year or so before trying to link up. So let's say you've been living aboard your sailboat for a year now and you're loving it. What sort of possibilities exist for the social Vanuin? The answer? A mobile intentional community. Or, as per the title, a permanent floating voluntary society. For those new to the concept, an intentional community can be defined as a planned community designed from the start to have a high degree of social cohesion and teamwork. The members typically hold a common social, political, religious, or spiritual vision and often follow an alternative lifestyle. Similar to a van nomad caravan, the idea is to still have the workings and culture of a small society. Division of labor, labor specialization, the ability to pool together resources, etc. You may be lucky enough to have a handful of families ready to set sail around the same time as you are. If so, you've already got the fixings for this community to develop. If you're heading out solo, without any potential mates, then it may be a little more difficult, especially when it comes to the stringent philosophical requirements for Ivanuin. Your pool of potential candidates shrinks. Rayo discusses the advantages of this strategy in Vanu, the search for personal freedom. The Voluntary Floating Association has some advantages over the free hamlet in the hills. Not only will anchors be lowered where state interference is minimal, the very mobility discourages interventions. For instance, state school officials seldom molest the children of transients. Another blessing for parents, the irrationalist coercivist influence of outside peer groups and mass communication media is considerably reduced. Differences of objectives and conflicts of personality, which may disrupt an immobile, intentional community, are easily resolved. The dissenters weigh anchor and a community can develop by easy steps and without formal direction. No would-be founder need acquire a large tract of land, uncertain as to market demand or the response of the state. From the minimalist sailboating vlogs I follow, it seems that these associations tend to happen spontaneously. Hopefully you'll have similar luck. In conclusion, minimalist sailboating is a terrific option for Vanuans. It does have some additional hurdles compared to van nomadism, but the increase in freedom is quite substantial. Instead of driving on government roads, you sail the high seas, where there really is no government. It's worth noting that sailing can be rather difficult. Here are some recommendations I'd make for someone interested in pursuing this lifestyle. Test out the lifestyle before committing. Life on sea is a whole hell of a lot different than life on land. I'd recommend taking a hitch sailing trip. It's hitchhiking only on the water. It's actually a rather safe practice, especially if you coordinate it in the fascist book group Sailboat Hitchhikers and Crew Connection. Many of those folks know each other and can vouch for other members. It's worth noting the importance of making sure you're compatible with the captain and his crew, if applicable. You don't want to be stuck in close quarters with folks you can't stand. It might sully your experience. Take your time and do your homework. The ocean can be a tranquil, enjoyable experience, but it can also be quite treacherous. The idea is self-liberation, not accidental suicide. Be willing to pay an experienced captain to teach you the ways of sailing. I don't know how much it costs, but I guarantee it's cheaper than going out as a novice and sinking a boat, or worse. The floating voluntary society begins with a population of one. Will you set sail for sunnier waters?